All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, still morning for a little bit. Um, very, very excited. So uh, as many of you know, not only this year with regards to Equip, are we making a switch to Paces from Prometheus. One of the other things we're doing is we're adding some new bundles around behavioral health. Um, and uh, we worked very hard on this uh, project over the last six months. And uh, I would like to thank... Um, uh, particularly all the folks at CRISP and PACES, but especially uh, Dr. Roca from Johns Hopkins, who was very helpful in getting these episodes completed and ready to roll for us. So uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, and I will go ahead and turn it over to Jessica to go ahead and begin the educational uh, meeting we're doing today on the new behavioral health episodes, which will be available for 2025. Thanks, Jessica, Jean. it is all you. Yeah, thanks, Jean. Um, so today we're going to do a, an overview of the program and dive into the two behavioral health episodes. Um, we know since this is a brand new specialty we're offering this year, there may be a little bit of a range of familiarity with the um, program in its entirety. So we'll kind of hit some of the points there. Um, but as you mentioned, dive into the two behavioral health episodes um, that we are rolling out and hope to have, um, you know, decent amount of participation in for next year. So let's get started. Um, we're talking about the EQIP program or the Episode Quality Improvement Program. Um, just for some background, the um, episode, the EQIP program was created really um, as a unique model under the total cost of care. Um, essentially, there have been national value-based care programs available, um, but really, not to Maryland um, practitioners and physicians. So the state went ahead um, in actually collaboration with MedKai and many other stakeholders of creating their own and wanted to create a program that wasn't just strictly around fee for service, but also provided um, some incentives around quality and reducing cost um, and really hopefully streamlining the alignment of both of those things to create a really good value-based care program. We like to say that the pillars of the EQIP program are really these four here, and that's really the intention of all of the methodology that was created for it. Um, first, it was intended to be centric around physicians or practitioners, really have them be the main owners of the program. So what this means is really if they are employed by hospitals, if they're independent, if you're a very large specialty group, or if you're a small um, independent um, group, all of these different types of physicians and practitioners can participate and can have their own ownership of the episodes in which they are choosing to participate with. The other big thing here is this is an upsides risks only. So what this means is that from a financial standpoint, there is only a um, net positive impact on your program or on your practice. Um, we do have some quality uh, quality and savings metrics that we'll go into um, towards the end of this about um, accountability and essentially, essentially your continued eligibility in the program, but there is no negative. We're not looking to take money back. Um, we actually don't even have a mechanism to take money back if you do not perform well in this program. But again, I really hope that people do participate and they perform well, but minimizing those barriers of entry. There's also alignment with some other payer episodic um, payment programs. So Care First sort of has a similar program. Um, I believe some of the other payers are just sort of entering this world. And our intention is to align when we can with these programs to hopefully reduce the administrative burden um, for those you know, personnel that may be managing. And then finally, this program does qualify as an AAPM or Advanced Alternative Payment Model. Um, so those that are participating in the program do get the perks of that. Um, they are exempt from MIPS reporting. Um, if there is um, a net lump sum perk to your Part B payments, um, again, that exact number changes year over year. It's set by CMS, but that is passed through to the participants of the program. Now for PY4, which is calendar year 2025, EQIP is utilizing the patient-centered episodes of care system, or what we refer to as PACES. That is the methodology for the grouper of these episodes. And you can see here that there is a wide variety of specialties that these episodes are aligned with. I do want to note that when we lump a specialty or an episode into specialty, um, that does not disqualify a different type of practitioner from enrolling in that episode. Um, I'll give some examples. Sometimes our chronic episodes may be aligned 
um, with, let's say, an allergist, but a primary care physician may also be eligible for it. So we keep that there and it's important and I think hopefully helps um, people find the areas of interest, but we do not want it to be a limiting factor um, for potential episodes that you may be eligible for. So a little bit about timeline. We talked about that we're, this PY4 is a calendar year, so it's running calendar year 2025, but the enrollment period is actually six months before that. So it, it's July through September are really our exact dates this year will be Monday, July 15th through August 30th. That is really the only time where new practices, new practitioners and physicians can join the EQIP program. Um, if we miss that window, unfortunately, you have to wait another year um, and participate in the 2026 cycle. Also, a little bit of note is that while the program does run over the, qual of, over the calendar year, everything in this program is claims-based. So there is a um, lag or a claims run out period. Um, so really what that means is that we anticipate payment typically in the third quarter following the end of the performance year. So again, if we're talking about PY4 calendar 2025, um, those practices that earned an incentive payment would likely see that in one check in one lump sum in the Q3 of calendar year 2026. So a little bit of the episodic value-based program. So essentially the goal of this bundled program is to make it hopefully more streamlined across the participation and the performance. So really what we look for is physicians or practitioner, practitioners to agree to participate in an episodic payment. So that's you all. You're saying, yes, I'm agreeing to be an EQIP and I'm agreeing for these specific episodes. From there, there is an agreement, uh, what we call a CRP, um, a, um, or sorry, a care partner arrangement with the CRP entity. It's a contract that essentially allows the payments to happen and for everyone to agree for some of the eligibility and participation qualifications. Um, that is required for every individual in EQIP. Um, and also essentially what we said is how are you participating? So you are letting us know which clinical episodes um, that you are, are participating with. Using that information, we can set a target price. So that is based off of um, the aggregation of those practitioners that are participating for you. And we get this average target price. And essentially we look at performance year. So in calendar 2025, how did your group perform compared to the target price? And we look at, was at an aggregation level, was savings achieved? And do you all get an incentive payment from that? And that's a pretty straight line forward. We'll go into a lot more details about that, but essentially that's how it works. Um, we, or typically what we've seen at a national level is many of the CMS bundled programs show around a four at a high end 6% um, reduction in gross Medicare spending. Um, we will note that in the first performance year for EQIP, which was calendar year 2022, the state saw about a 5% um, reduction in that savings. So um, we definitely considered it a success, success for that first year. So now let's get into a little bit of the weeds as far as the participation. What does this mean? What do I need to do? So with every lovely program, we have a lot of acronyms. Um, I think the big thing that we want to take away here is when I'm referring to an entity and a care partner, those are probably the biggest things. So a care partner is essentially an individual physician, an individual practitioner, and we identify this by a unique NPI number. Um, and that is that individual is essentially who triggers an episode or who is actually performing um, the, uh, the interventions when it aligns to an episode. That, as we mentioned, each individual, each unique MPI, each care partner does sign a unique agreement with the CRP entity. Um, please note that this does not impact any of the fee for service. So all of that continues as normal, but as a group, you have the potential to earn an incentive payment as part of the EQIP program. Um, additionally, as we mentioned, all that since this is an AAPM, qualifies as an AAPM um, program, all of the individuals or care partners that are participating in this are eligible for any QPP status or bonuses that that AAPM does allow. Now, EQIP entity, you'll hear me talk about this a lot. Sometimes we interchange it with practice, but it doesn't have to be. And what this means is this is essentially the level of the participation in the program. So it consists of either an individual care partner or multiple care partners. 
Many a times as I mentioned, this typically is aligned with practice, but it doesn't have to be. So for example, we do see currently right now, um, two different practices joining to create one entity or vice versa, maybe a subset of a practice um, you know, three of 10 providers that are participating in this program. So essentially it's up to you all um, how you'd like to participate and how you'd like to create your entity, but it is how performance is evaluated. So the aggregate of everyone, every unique NPI that you put in your Equip entity ultimately um, rolls up to creating your target price. It rolls up to your performance. That is really the evaluation mechanism. And finally, that Equip entity is the mechanism that where you receive an incentive payment if it's earned. And again, that's one single lump sum. So across, you know, 50 MPIs, the aggregation of performance, if you do show savings, you would get a single um, check that is sent to um, that equip entity, you all let us know where to send it and how you choose to distribute it or anything else that is determined sort of within the entity. But at the programmatic level, we send the check to the entity. Now you hear CRP entity, and this is um, important because that agreement that we um, talked about that is required for every NPI that is signed with the CRP entity. Um, for this program, um, we thank our volunteers, UMS, who have done a wonderful job the last couple of years um, as this program has grown exponentially, and they are essentially who is cutting the check to you all. And finally, HSCRC CRISP, you'll hear us a lot, but really this is the back end, the administrative portion of it. So HSCRC are the ones who are actually setting the um, methodology, setting um, the target prices, things like that. Um, CRISP helps support this, obviously the portal that we host and we try to do a lot of sort of collaboration and assistance um, with facilitating success within the program. Um, and finally, your, your administrative proxies. So this essentially is a um, role sort of within the program that allows um, administrators or other clinical leaders to have access to the entity. They have the same information that let's say your lead um, physician may have when they create the entity, but it allows essentially people to, to do lots of other things and you get assistance from other members of your team. So let's talk about CRP entity. I mentioned this is the University of Maryland Medical Center um, who have served as a wonderful partner for this. And really what we wanna specify here is they play a very vital role, but it is um, discreet. So essentially they are the ones that you're assigning that, signing the care partner arrangement with, and they are the ones that are printing the check. We want to um, really emphasize and note that the CRP entity or UMS does not have any access to your PHI, um, and they do not have any access to the detailed information as far as performance analytics. Um, the state and HSCRC are the ones that tell them whom to pay and how much. Um, again, they play a very vital role because it is the payment mechanism, um, but there is a discrete um, sort of administrative non-PHI function that they play. We'll also note that you do not need to have um, any type of current relationship with UMS in order to be eligible. Um, it's just an important thing to note. You don't need to have privileges with the system. You may not even touch the system, um, but if you do and if you don't, all everyone is eligible. We just wanna make sure that that doesn't um, deter anyone from participating. Cause again, it's a completely vital um, necessary and the wonderful partners in this role, but it is distinct in sort of their responsibilities. Okay, so participation requirements. I think this is a big one. Hopefully this first box on the left is an easier one, but you must be licensed um, and um, able to bill Medicare. And we do check that and vet everything through the PICO system. You also must um, be part, uh, you ha must have a certified electronic health record and participate in the Maryland Health Information Exchange or participate with CRISP. Um, again, hopefully those things have already been approved. Um, if you do not participate with CRISP, that is something that we can facilitate during this um, enrollment period. Now, enrolling in EQIP, we met the biggest thing that we talked about was that participation mechanism or the EQIP entity. So essentially, you all need to establish that. Tell us, am I going at this alone as an individual physician or am I joining up with multiple care partners? Once that is established, you select which episodes um, there are two episodes specific for behavioral health, but you could be a multi-specialty entity and do both behavioral health and one of the other categories as well. 
Um, and you agree to the quality metrics, you agree to the care partner arrangement, and again, you tell us where would you like that payment to be sent if you earn it. All of that is sort of in this enrollment process. Now, how do I know what I can sign up for is in this threshold piece. So meeting the threshold, again, you have to provide care in Maryland. Um, there are two different volume thresholds. The first one is at a single episode level. So you need to have, again, at your entity, your entity has to have at least 11 episodes in the baseline period to qualify. So emphasizing entity, because if you have a single NPI or single care partner, that means that individual has to be have 11, 11 um, episodes of volume in the baseline period. However, if you have five or six care partners in your entity, the aggregation of the volume across all six must meet 11. However, at, across all episodes, you have to have 50. So to simplify it across the two different behavioral health episodes, if you are choosing to do both, you can have 20 and 30, you can have um, 10, or you can't have 10, sorry. <laughs> you can have 25 and 25, uh, but you have to meet 11 in each of them and 50 total. Um, but if you're choosing to do just one episode, technically that threshold must be met for that one episode individually. So you really need 50 of that one. This is all information that's gonna be available in the portal. It's very transparent. So you can see based off of these NPIs, I can see the volume. I know if I'm eligible or not. We're also here to help you if you have questions about that. Um, now, when an episode is selected, um, there also is, there's a requirement to select an intervention. So essentially you select a category, um, clinical care redesign, beneficiary caregiver engagement, or care transitions and care coordination and care transitions. These are things you may already be doing, or they may be things that you plan to do as a way to hopefully achieve savings in the program. You can see some examples here. Um, you can select one, you can select more than one, but essentially when you are enrolling, you also are agreeing to doing something uh, as a part of uh, hopefully meeting the goals of the program. This is a, simply a checkbox. There is actually no like additional uh, description that is required for that. Okay, so the PY4 specialties that are available and episodes here, um, there are about 65, I think we may be even closer to 70 episodes at this point. You can see the variety of different specialty categories that are. Um, I'll obviously highlight the two in the behavioral health world, which is chronic anxiety and recurrent depression. Those are the two that are brand new being offered this year. Some of these have been offered since year one. And again, we have a mix of those that are PACES specific and some that are sort of homegrown or non-PACES. That really is the emergency department area is primarily those um, different types of episodes. So let's talk about equip policy and methodology. So really there's two different categories here. PACES is the grouper. It is the mechanism that we are using to essentially define costs. And we'll go into a little bit about the different categories there. But then there's the whole policy world, and that's essentially what HSCRC and CMS um, help facilitate. So that is the methodology of how exactly target price is set, how do we determine if you're, you would um, get an incentive payment and how much of the shared incentive payment would you be getting, what are the quality measures, all things like that sort of fall into that bucket. So let's focus on the left bucket first, which is PACES. So PACES is a brand new grouper we are using this year. We used a different grouper for the first three years. Um, one of the reasons we switched to this grouper is there's a high level of transparency with this. Um, we actually can make available Excel playbooks of the two behavioral health episodes that we overview so that people can see the exact codes that we're talking about. Um, but a little bit about PACES, they were incorporated in 2019. They are a non-for-profit. Um, and really their focus is on developing these clinically sound episodes. Um, they review and update them on a regular basis. They partner very well with clinical experts. Um, actually, these behavioral health episodes are a result of that partnership. We talked about Dr. Roca in the beginning, but again, want to really thank him for his time and commitment to help vet these episodes and get them to a point where they're deployable and ready to be used for a program such as ours. So they have a library of about just north of a thousand um, episodes that are available. Um, we're actually should say in different stages of availability. Some of them do need to be vetted more. Some of them again are ready to use right now. 
We really focused on the 60 some episodes that we're deploying this year. We were focusing on the ones that aligned to the previous grouper that we used rather than adding a ton of new episodes. But really, but really our focus of adding net new was around this behavioral health specialty. So with these episodes, they kind of have three discrete categories. Um, every episode has an episode trigger. Um, that's the main uh, mechanism for construction of the episode. It is typically uh, ICD-10 for an acute event or a CPT slash HIXPIX code for a procedure type of episode. And what those codes do is they essentially unequivocally say that this condition is present or this procedure happened. Um, it opens the episode. From there, there's a look back period and a close period. All of those or both of those periods are unique to the episode. So the look back window, 30 days is pretty common, but it's essentially going to look at costs, relevant costs in those 30 days prior. And then the close period, again, can be variable based off of is it an acute episode? Is it chronic? Is it a procedure? Is it a major procedure episode? All things like that. But you can sort of see a range of the close period. You have shorter ones on the 14 days after the trigger or longer ones up to six months or even in both of the behavioral health episodes cases, they go through the end of the performance year or would end on December 31st of 2025. Um, all of that sort of encompasses an episode. Um, I'll show the specifics of the next two ones, but I will note that a lot of these codes here, we obviously can't put it on a single PowerPoint, but would be available in those guidebooks. And that really was that really close collaboration that Dr. Roca did with the PACES team to ensure the soundness of all the codes that are going into this episode construction. Um, okay, so the first episode for behavioral health is chronic anxiety. This does have a 30 day look back window. So you can see here, there is a discrete, distinct ICD-10 for the trigger code. Once that is opened, there's a 30 day look back and the episode is measured through December 31st or the end of the study period for us. Um, there's a lot more information. And like I said, we really highly recommend looking at the playbooks when you send out because there's a lot of um, additional ICD 10s when it comes to relevant procedures and relevant diagnosis that essentially say what is counted in this window. Similar for recurrent depression, you actually have the same time period here. So you have a 30 day look back, you have it goes through the end of the study period. Um, but a few more ICD 10s that again unequivocally say that this specific condition has been met um, with a whole slew of other um, relevant diagnoses and relevant procedures. So let's talk a little bit about price methodology, because essentially PACES gave us the construction of the episode, they gave us all the costs that are included, and they gave us the logic for when an episode actually opens. But how do we know if there, you've been successful in showing cost savings? And it really comes down to the target price. So calendar year 2019 is serving as the baseline. It has um, for the last three years and will continue through next year. Um, I will note that the HSCRC is committed to reevaluating that in future years. Um, however, that again, COVID, a lot of program transitions really committed to keeping that stable for right now. But essentially we look back at um, the performance of that collection of MPIs or at the entity level in the 2019 period in order to set the target price. Um, volume and not volume, sorry, cost is trended forward and put in today's dollars. So you do have an apples apples comparison. Um, it'll be put in the 2025 dollars for next performance year. Um, and for that, we just wanna note that target price is considered preliminary at the start of the year because additional inflation and update factors are sent throughout the year and your target price will be adjusted to reflect that. Um, we also wanna note that there is a singular target price set at the entity. So this is independent of the setting of care, probably doesn't apply as much for behavioral health, but in some of our other um, episodes, if it's done at an ASC, a hospital, an outpatient facility, you can see a drill down and breakdown of your cross across those different settings of care, but a single target price is set for you, and that is your goal to show savings on. Um, the idea here is really looking at um, alignment of um, potentially lower acuity procedures in a safe and potentially lower cost setting, if that is an option, um, and if there is any option for um, overuse or overutilization of services, all of those things sort of go into play here. 
So what do we do with this target price and how does it translate to a potential check? So essentially what we look at the end of the year, um, so at the end of calendar year 2025, really we're looking at more of like Q2 in 2026 when you talk about claims run, everything that we will look at your performance across that period and determine are they less than the target price? Pretty simple equation there. Um, but we do require at least a 3% of savings in that um, to earn an incentive payment. And the reason is that is that we don't want it to be random variation. We do want it to show a statistical significance. So that 3% savings has to be met. Once that is met, we say, okay, how much of this 3% savings or or, or more savings do you, does your entity get to keep? And this is the only time in sort of the peer-to-peer -peer comparison comes into play. So using your baseline data, um, in 2019, we rank based off of efficiency in that baseline year. So it's broken out into three different tercials. If you think um, sort of our uh, practices or entities that have the most opportunity, they're considered higher cost in 2019, um, they fall into the lowest tercile. Um, if they show savings, they do get to keep 50% of the savings. The state gets to keep the other 50%. Um, the idea there is there may be more opportunity, some low hanging fruit. Um, there's essentially they can move the needle a bit more. Whereas our more efficient or lower cost um, practices or entities in 2019, let's say they're in the top tercile, um, they get to keep 80% of their savings. It may be a little bit harder. They may have already shown some efficiencies. So the idea there is um, they get to keep a, a larger, uh, larger share of that. All entities, regardless of where they fall on the tercile, does have a clinical quality score. And what that means is 5% of whatever savings you will have earned are withheld and earned back based off of the um, performance in the three quality metrics. We'll go over what those three are, are shortly. Um, but essentially, you can earn up to all 5% of that back or just a portion of it. So now that we know the total number uh, or amount that you earn from your incentive payment, we do have to check that against a cap. So CMS does require that the maximum payment amount does not exceed um, more than 25% of the prior year's Part B payments. Um, we actually did have some entities that maxed that out. Um, so it is a check that we need to do. And then finally, once we know all that, we pay that to you all. It is paid in full um, directly to the payment remission recipient that's indicated by the EQIP entity, um, typically about closer to nine months after the close of the period. Um, okay, so let me, probably we'll skip this slide, but I think when you guys will believe if you choose to return to this, it says kind of walk through exactly what those numbers may look like as you go through that flow, that process flow that we just reviewed. Okay, so let's talk about just savings, accountability, and we'll also talk about quality because again, there's a, an accountability there too. So as we mentioned, one of the big perks of this program is there is no financial risk. When you enter the program financially, it can only be a plus. But because of that, or really in lieu of that, we have a um, dis savings accountability or dis savings policy um, that will allow us to remove entities that are not performing well. So essentially, if you create dis savings in your first performance year, um, you are required to offset that amount before earning a check in the next year. Additionally, if you are in the lower two tercials, um, so there's opportunity for savings, um, and you have two consecutive years of just savings, you will been, been, it be ineligible, sorry, tongue twister, to um, participate in the next year. Um, there's a little bit of uh, extra years that are built in there because of the way claims run out, but essentially we are in very close conversation with this. This does not come as a shock. Um, and essentially also the HSCRC is really monitoring this to ensure that there is no unintended consequences of potential removal of, um, of entities from the program. So the next piece we'll talk about is that quality measure section. So we mentioned this is something that every um, entity is evaluated on, but those that earn savings, there is 5% that they earn back based off of this. One of the big things to note here is the quality metrics are part B claims measurable. So 
one of the things we really want to do is to reduce any type of reporting or administrative burden for participants. Um, but with that, we do rely on claims. So some of the opportunity that we see for people who may not be performing well in quality metrics, especially during the baseline period, is a little bit of essentially about how it's being measured. Is it actually getting into the claims data? Um, the HSCRC, when they set these, these uh, quality metrics, wanted to ensure, again, that they are measurable via claims. There is um, an alignment across all different specialties. We did not create unique quality metrics for each of these different ones. Um, and we did want to align with some of the larger state priorities. So with that said, the three that are being measured are advanced care planning, documentation of current medication in the medical record, and preventative care and screening for BMI. So with that, I think one of the big things to mention is how we actually are measuring this. And really, we look at once the episode ends, um, were these three metrics performed in the year prior by anyone? Um, so what that means is that your triggering practitioner does not necessarily have to be the one to perform these three quality metrics. They could be working, you know, with their referral stream or, you know, potentially if it's being done at a hospital with other resources within the hospital, but it does have to happen somewhere. And really, attend, essentially, we're looking at that collaboration and co coordination across the continuum of care in order for these quality metrics to happen. Um, as we mentioned, we'll look at the total performance and you'll earn back 5% of that. The other aspect, and we probably shot a bullet here, is that if there are, again, two consecutive years of um, probationary performance on the quality metrics, the same thing exists where that entity would no longer be eligible to um, participate in the next year. I will note that we saw some entities in year one and year two that were considered, you know, in the lower, I think it's 20th percentile on the state in quality um, in that baseline period. And everyone moved out of sort of that probationary at risk state. Um, and again, I think a lot of it was sort of attention to how this was being done and that collaboration coordination with potentially other care members for this patient. Okay, so the CRISP EPRIP entity portals is essentially how am I actually going to enroll? How do you know what we're what we're enrolling in? And essentially, we've created this one-stop shop for equip entities. And what it does is it allows individuals to go in to look at um, or upload a collection of NPIs that they would like to be in an entity and therefore see their opportunity. What episodes am I eligible for? What is my volume? What is an approximation of total cost? Um, and they can go in and say, I actually want to participate in these episodes. I want to select these care interventions. And I'm going to tell you, if I get an uh, incentive check, where am I going to do it? All of that is there. Um, we do, you do need access to this portal. So one of the things you'll hear time and time here is equip at crisphealth.org. We can essentially facilitate what your next steps are here. One of the things we talked about as an overall program eligibility is participating in the state HRE or participating with CRISP. Net new practices that have not interacted with CRISP before does require them to do an additional step of CRISP onboarding. Um, if you do not know, again, we essentially can look it up and we'll facilitate, can you go directly into the portal or do you need to fill out some of that participation um, agreement forms in order to participate with CRISP and thus get access? So we'll, we'll tell you all that. I also will note that this portal is the place where your baseline data will become available and the performance data will be updated as it becomes available and claims come in. So I think we summarized essentially the perks of this program it really is intended to be super centric around physicians and clinicians. Um, there is no risk. We hope that there's a very, very low barrier of entry here. Um, if you're sort of unsure, we can work with you on that. Um, and we really want alignment um, independent of employment or setting up care or anything like that. We want everyone to be eligible to participate in this. Um, and as you can see, these episodes really have been tailored to align with state priorities and what our stakeholders needs are. That really is what brought these behavioral health episodes to fruition this year. Um, let's talk a little about timeline because I think those are the big ones here. Um, I apologize, the first slide actually should say July 15th. Um, but that is when the EQIP portal does open uh, for enrollment. We want to have conversations over the next two weeks. If you're interested, doesn't need to wait until the 15th. 
especially if there may be that um, need to do some additional paperwork and crisp onboarding, please reach out now and we'll get you to the right place. So hopefully by July 15th, it's a very simple process for the actual enrollment portion. We do have a webinar on their enrollment, so you can see exactly what steps you need to do, where to click within the system. Um, we believe that the whole process from a, a, a input standpoint probably shouldn't take more than 30 minutes, but we do wanna sort of align with that with any internal conversations and strategy that you may be needing to do internally or familiar to familiarize yourself with the program itself. Again, we can help with all that. The deadline is the 30th. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much wiggle room on that because essentially as soon as that is done, we submit all of the providers, again, unique MPIs to CMS for vetting. And they do review every single MPI to ensure that they're eligible to participate in this QPP program. Um, if there are providers that drop off, we communicate that back with you. If that doesn't affect eligibility, again, all of that is communicated and we work with entities one-on-one. -on -one. Um, one quick here. question. When do you think we'll be able to um, run panels of MPI numbers to see what elig what they're eligible for? Do you think we're going to be closer to the 15th on that, or is that going to be maybe a little earlier? I I would say probably closer to the 15th. If we're talking about earlier, we're talking about like days earlier. So um, I would say if you have it, let us know. We'll put you in the queue. Um, it's not ready quite yet, but um, hopefully it will be soon. Well, um, I would encourage the practitioners who mm -hmm. are on and the and I see we have some hospital reps and some others that they should really get their MPI list of possible practitioners and get in the queue because Chris and we can help with this too at MedKai. We can, but Chris can run what bundles you're eligible for and that will help you make decisions. And I would also say, because I do see a couple small practitioners on here, if you think you might not have enough folks to um, hit the attribution requirements, we are very happy at MedKai to help you set up an equip entity with some other practitioners so they can um, so they can participate. So if, if you want to do it and you're concerned or you need help, reach out to Olivia or myself or Jessica and we will help you. Sorry, Jessica. Yeah. No, no, no. I think that's a good plug because um, I these are all sort of things that we want to be happening like now, if we can, as much as we can assist you right now. Um, because we are working on sort of a shorter window for actual enrollment. Um, and one of the reasons we mentioned why we have to do this six months ahead is because CMS vetting, but also there's a fair amount of like auditing that needs to happen as far as eligibility. And that all happens in the fall, essentially. Then we work to the care partner arrangements. Um, this is probably the administrative proxy's least favorite part, but they do um, assist us in sort of getting a signature by for every unique practitioner that is participating in the program so that they are attesting that they are in EQIP, they are in this entity, they're agreeing to participate in aggregate and whatever their uh, performance contribution may be, um, the aggregate um, incentive payment is sent to the entity. Um, we will have all of that, we'll communicate all that, but all of that needs to happen essentially before the start of the year. Um, and the uh, program does officially start on January 1st of next year. And as we mentioned, it goes through the entire calendar year, but with claims run out and um, running the reconciliation process, we're looking at um, incentive payment distribution typically, and we'll say in fall of calendar 2026. So I think that was a lot. I think um, I just want to note here that, um, you know, we do have, we will make ourselves available to anyone who wants to meet one-on-one -on -one to talk about EQIP. If you want more details about the program, um, discuss any opportunities or the enrollment, um, if you have the workbooks that you're reviewing and have questions on that, again, happy to do that. Um, and then also want to note that we do have bi-monthly um, subgroup meetings that MedKai hosts. Um, our next one actually is in July. And if you want to be um, added to that distribution list, please email Olivia. Um, but we do have the recordings all up there. Um, and I will note that the uh, I said the enrollment period opens the 15th. So that's really the important date in, that you guys should have down. Um, I believe I saw a hand. Hey, uh, Maggie Smith from UMS. Thank you so much for walking through this. We're really excited about the new BH episodes. Quick question. Do you have an anticipated release date for the uh, transition guides? Yeah, so all of that will be available before the 15th. Um, I want to say this week, but it, you know, maybe next week. Uh, we essentially are working on it very hard and everything will be available. Um, but as soon as we have it, we will like uh, blast the communication out to everyone, um, including the, the episode workbooks that we talked about. Okay, awesome, thank you. 
And Nina, I think I'm seeing your hand up as well. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And thanks so much to Dr. Roca and the Chris and Medkai teams for the um, all the work on the behavioral health episodes. I would echo Maggie's comments that we're excited to see these. Um, question about those episodes. So um, given that the Medicare population for these behavioral health conditions might be relatively small compared to the larger population experiencing those conditions, have you heard any conversation around any intention for other payers to participate or, or align with those episodes? I don't know if you've heard anything that you might be able to share. Um, I don't know if I see Krista on the line at all. I'll, I'll just say we would love that. I think that's one of the major goals um, is to have other payers alignment. As far as I'm aware, CareFirst is the only other commercial payer um, that does episodes like this. And I do not believe they have any behavioral health. Um, again, anyone correct me if I'm wrong. I think Krista and Nate are a little bit more familiar with their bundles. That's correct, Jessica. This is Krista. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'll add, we um, ran just some very, like, very rough numbers. We did see a potential of about 60,000 episodes that were in the baseline for these two um, uh, these two behavioral health episodes. We'll have, again, a little bit more detail as our team's working through sort of all the fine details of getting these PACES definitions, but there is opportunity there. Um, and again, as we continue to grow, we, again, love that alignment and, you know, future, maybe even add different behavioral health episodes. So uh, just one other, a little more information on that related to Medicaid. So MedKai actually supported, it was Beacon, I think they're now called Clarion or something, uh, their bid and they won the behavioral health bid. And uh, as part of that bid, there was language in there saying they would do behavioral health. Um, we MedKai had a very, very positive meeting with them um, uh, about possibly including this in some fashion in Medicaid going forward. Uh, now, obviously, they're drinking from a fire hose as they plan for the transition to take over the carve out. But I think that the response being very positive and the fact that they actually put language in there to make it an option means that we might have a better uh, possibility of getting these bundles included in the Medicaid than we did, than we've had dealing with the Medicaid department on primary care it was kind of blocked MDPCP for years now. So that's that's something that's a positive thing that that at least Medkai is working on from a from a lobbying perspective, you know, uh, pushing perspective. So I'm hoping we can get more alignment. Uh, right now we have Care First doing a handful of the original bundles and value care based care programs, but we really would like to see more alignment with more of the payers. So if anybody has suggestions on how to do that, we would be very, very open to hearing from you. I'm not seeing any other questions. I think Olivia dropped the link in for the enrollment webinar, um, which is up. But um, yeah, essentially, please reach out to us. We really hope to see this grow. Um, not to put you on the spot, Dr. Rukav, I do see you're on the line. I don't know if there's anything that you want to specifically say about um, the behavioral health episodes. Like I said, I know you did a ton of work, and we are truly appreciative of the time you spent with, with PACES. I was trying to unmute there. No, no, I appreciate your expressions of gratitude, and I'll be really excited to see what the uptake is and how it works. Okay. Well, I think we're um, done here. We will have a lot of materials available. There's workbooks, the transition guides. Um, like I said, you will be able to see detail and PI breakdown once you are in the enrollment portal. But as Jean mentioned, we also can run some sort of customized MPI um, reports as it becomes available. Everything definitely will be available the 15th. If it is available a couple of days earlier, we will let people know. And again, I would just reiterate, do not hesitate to reach out to Olivia at MedKai, myself at MedKai, or Crystal or Jessica at Crisp. We are here to help. We want people to have their questions answered. So if if you you know have questions about anything with regards to Equip or this or, or any of the other bundles, do not hesitate to reach out. We're here to help you. All right. Thanks, Gene. Is that a Thanks, wrap? everyone. All right. Terrific. Talk to you later. Bye.